As a reporter and columnist, Christy Blatchford has observed some of the most notorious trials in recent Canadian history. From Senator Mike Duffy, to broadcaster Gian Gameshi, to the truly horrific trial of murderer and rapist Paul Bernardo. And from that courtside view, her estimation of the system does not a happy story make. She maps it all out in her new book. It's called Life Sentence, stories from four decades of court reporting, or how I fell out of love with the Canadian justice system, especially judges. And Christy Blatchford joins us now. That's that a mouthful, a, isn't that it? That is a superb subtitle, I gotta say. My editor can take all the credit. He I wrote really, it. I, it's wonderful. And it's, as usual, you write a great book, Christy. And, well, uh, thank you. Congrats and welcome back here. I'm going to start by reading a little passage here, which will set up the first question, and here we go. I still like some things about the courts, you write, but I stick it out for the same reason people stay, sometimes too long, in flawed marriages. It's good more of the time than it is bad, barely. Let's explore. Why have you stayed in this flawed marriage for so long? Well, partly because I still really enjoy it. I like, you know, I, I guess I need structure, so I like having a time to go and I, you know, I know how the thing is going to work. So I like that. I think it's important. I think, you know, in a democracy, a, a public court system is really important. And I think also that sometimes the lives of the people whose murders I cover would not otherwise get any attention. And it's important for us to remember people who were members of our community and who are no longer with us. So it's a, it's a bunch of stuff. It's a means of showing respect, that last part, I guess. Eh? Yeah, it is. Well, and bringing dignity. You know, I'm thinking of a case I covered uh, earlier this year, uh, uh, or late last year, a teenager named Melanie Bittersing, who had been brought here by her, her father and ended up living in a horrible house. Her, they came, she and her siblings came from Jamaica and all their big dreams on the airplane over here. And we heard about that because we, the birth mother had testified when she said goodbye to them, <clears throat> excuse me, in Jamaica, how excited they were. And anyway, within a matter of months, Melanie was dead, her body stuffed into a suitcase and her little brother was also dead. It's terrible, you know, so it matters. How do you cover as much gore as you do without it taking its toll on you? Well, it does take its toll, uh, but it, it seems to be um, because I write about it and I share the burden of my knowledge, this is, it, it's actually quite cathartic, um, but I, I, I weep in court almost every day. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, Sam Bazzano from The Sun, who often sits next to me at trials, will tell you that he hears the first signs. He says, oh, geez, here she goes, you know. So, I mean, it, it is affecting, it's deeply moving, but if you're reasonably, and I'm only reasonably well adjusted, I think you can deal with this stuff. Well, I'm gonna follow up on that because last week we did a program uh, which involved an interview with a fella who had been on a jury mm -hmm. and it was a gruesome case and he discovered after the fact that he clinically suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. and it has really um, dramatically affected his life and his ability to cope. How can you have sat through so many of the awful trials that you have and it hasn't affected your ability to cope? Because of this outlet that I have, that is my job. I mean, every day when I, you know, when I often cry writing my columns, you know, going through my notebooks. Uh, when I threw out my cache of uh, notebooks from the Bernardo trial, for instance, I found that pages were all stuck together. And the reason they were stuck together, which I'd forgotten about, was that I was crying so hard every day in that trial that my nose ran, so they were stuck together with my snot. Not a great image, <laughs> but the truth. Um, that is so you, I gotta say. Yeah, no kidding. No, and so you to fess up about it, you know? Well, I, I was shocked when I realized how hard I'd been crying, and then I remembered, of course. So I have the catharsis of the, the outlet. I spread my burden by, you know, writing about it and somebody else reads about it. I want to pick up on the last uh, couple of words of the subtitle there, the especially judges part. And you do write some uh, very, uh, I have to say, very funny yet very pointed stuff about judges who have driven you crazy over the years. Mm -hmm. Tell us one story here. Give me an example of a, of a judge who, I mean, I know the book is filled with them, but still. Sure. Who you think is just, <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, uh, the judge in the Mike Duffy trial, who is a very good judge. Everybody said so, right? Everybody you said so. You quoted every lawyer in the world who said he was fair-minded and brilliant and etc. That's right, and of course, lawyers say that because they might appear before the judge someday and they're... Sucking up. You know, yes, yeah, sucking up in advance, so... But, but he is apparently a good judge, so this isn't about his ability to be a good judge. It's just about his ability to show up on time. <laughs> um, the trial takes place in Ottawa, and it was in segments, as you may remember. 
but halfway through the first segment, I time judges. I time, I have this kind of a watch, mm -hmm. my running watch. Digital with a second. Yep. Uh, so I know when court starts and when it breaks. Uh, I learned to do this with another judge who was very late all the time. Anyway, so Judge Viancourt and I, as it happens, are both staying at the Lord Elgin in Ottawa. The courthouse is across the street. I manage to make it there every day on time. It's shocking, isn't it? Every day he doesn't. So I'm sitting in the courtroom like a lunatic. Every other participant is there, all the lawyers, the accused, the witnesses and stuff, the cops. He doesn't. The judge isn't there. Now, no doubt he was doing something deeply important, but I thought it was disrespectful not to show up on time. And it suddenly occurred to me, these guys are just like Senator Mike Duffy. They're unelected, unaccountable, entitled, and they forget that they work for us, not the other way around. Did, so, you, did you ever ask him what, why he was always late? No, I didn't, but I did write about it. And the mm -hmm. next day, he was on time, was on and time. thereafter. Well, let me. Pick but up, they never read the press. Let me. Right, <laughs> they never read the press. Let me pick up on another one. I think, and I can't remember her name now. It was a female judge. Who, Eleanor Schnall. That's the one. That's the appointed one. Appointed in 1991 by the Bob Ray government. Yep. Okay. Uh, again, you suggested to her, uh, you had the temerity to suggest to her that actually starting court at 10 o'clock when everybody else was at work already by 9 wasn't such a great idea, and you'd be happy to come in an hour early to get your stuff done. How did yeah. she take to that suggestion? Uh, she bitch slapped me, basically. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to put it. <laughs> but that was her thing. This yeah. was a judge. One day in that courtroom, remember, court sits from 10 to 4.30. Uh, so whatever the hours there are the hours of work, theoretically. But I timed it, of course. I began my timing practices with her. And I think we actually sat for about two hours and a quarter one day. It was outrageous. And she would regularly berate the lawyers, especially the lawyers for the press, who were trying to overturn her multiple public publication bans. Mm -hmm. And she would say, I'm not, sp I'm not wasting any more time on this. And finally, as you note, I stood up. I dared stand up in court and said, told her who I was and said, I'd be happy to get my lawyer there tomorrow morning at 9 if perhaps we could start early. And I forget now what she said, but it was essentially a bitch slap. Oh, slapped. she did. She slapped you down. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it was 10 o'clock the next day. It wasn't 9 Oh, no. It, well, yeah. it would be 10.20 in her 10 world. 10.20. Right. Yeah. You do suggest, though, and you just said it a moment ago, that you think, uh, obviously unelected, but you said unaccountable. And I'm sure judges would take great umbrage at the notion that they are unaccountable. And if you look at some of the, for example, the Judge Camp, you know, business that's been going on lately, mm -hmm. uh, he would say he is paying a, a high price for his, and there are other examples you've given in the book of judges who uh, are embarrassed and pay high prices and go before panels of other judges to be judged for their bad behavior or their malfeasance. Doesn't that count? Oh, certainly it counts, and I think the Canadian Judicial Council is getting better at making all the information in those cases available, but it's very rare still, and we know very little about <clears throat> who sorts out the complaints. Like, they get more than those three complaints mm -hmm. a year. Who decides that they're not serious? Who investigates them, etc.? And the, the, it's the principle of it which is important. And the principle, think of the last time, if you can remember, that a police force investigated one of its own for a shooting. They don't do that no, they anymore. Don't, they, don't. they have the, in Ontario, they have the Special Investigations Unit, yeah. an independent body which comes in and either in investigates and either charges the officer or doesn't. Mm. And it gives you some comfort as a citizen to know that an outside agency is looking at them. It's true for journalists. You have the Broadcast Standards Council and mm -hmm. other things that print journalists have, the Ontario Press Council, and have for years. We don't, we aren't the only judges of our own conduct and work. Judges are the only judges of other judges. And their work is, trust me, not that special that it requires that. Well, I'm going to push back on that because they would say it is and they would say, I mean, what, what was the example of, uh, there were some complaints of uh, Wally Opal, British Columbia judge, you yep. talk about in the book where <clears throat> yep. he suggested that, uh, you know, the judges might be making just enough money, thank you very much. And He also suggested that they might show up an hour earlier. They might show up an hour earlier and, and the Chief Justice of British Columbia shot back, mind your own damn business and stop, you, you, this is an affront to our judicial independence. I mean, there is something to, maybe not on that case, but there is something no, to judicial course. independence. Judicial independence <clears throat> basically means you have to pay your judges well enough that they're not tempted by right. other things, that you have to separate the legislative uh, arm completely, mm. etc. And I believe deeply in le uh, judicial independence, but not the way it's, it's been used as a shield for any sort of mm. scrutiny. 
And a good recent example is the rapper from Nova Scotia who recently mm -hmm. took um, took offense to a set sentence a judge had passed in a in a, a child sexual assault case, and he asked people to write to the judge. And faster than you could say, Jack the Bear, the l l obedient little lawyers association in Halifax was, oh, we protest. It's very nasty. It's you know, woo. as John Moore would say, uh, a, a guy whose radio show I'm on. Pearls were clutched. <laughs> they do a lot of clutching of pearls clutching. on the bench. Would putting cameras in the courtroom absolutely brilliant? Better idea. idea. Yeah. Well, and but let's not hold our breath. Cameras in the courtroom would bring an instant accountability to the whole process. I mean, even if it was one fixed camera at the back of the room focused only on the witness and the judge, fine, if that's how you want to do it. But honest to Pete, they were talking about bringing cameras into the courtroom back at the time of the Bernardo trial in the mid-1990s. And there was a government committee and a committee with judges on it, and they were all going to look at it. There's no will. They don't want that kind of accountability. Do you know who has cameras in the courtroom? The some some places the, do. The Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of Canada has yep. cameras in the courtroom. And I'll tell you what, every time I watch, yes, I'm nerdy enough on a Saturday at 1 in the morning to watch repeats on CPAC of, yep. of the Supreme Court. I have done too. It is impressive. Yeah. It, I, I find they come across really quite And they wonderfully. would, because yeah. the quality of judges in this country is actually pretty good. Hmm. It's the processes that surround them that I question, really. Okay, let's get, a, you know, I, in some respects, but you've written about it, so we've got to talk about it. Uh, the Bernardo case of many years ago, which was the most, hor probably the most horrendous case in Canadian uh, history, certainly one of them. What was different about that case from everything else you've covered? What was different is the lack of vigor with which the state prosecuted Carla Homolka. You'll remember there was a deal, a plea bargain. I never objected to the plea bargain. I understand why they had to make it. Mm -hmm. What they didn't have to do... Just remind everybody, she testified against him she te for yeah, a lesser sentence. That's right. She testified against her then-husband, Paul mm -hmm. Bernardo, in exchange for a 12-year sentence for her role in three deaths. With that of her own baby sister, whom she handed over rather cheerfully to Bernardo one Christmas. For a birthday present. For, uh, no, it was a Christmas present. Oh, Christmas present, sorry, yes. Um, and Tammy died choking on her own vomit uh, mm -hmm. on Christmas Eve, as I recall. Um, and Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. So we all accepted, I think, the... Canada accepted that there was a need to make a, a deal with her. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we needed the witness. Then it turns out there were these videotapes, and they didn't need her, not nearly mm -hmm. as much. But instead of acknowledging that, there's a way to call somebody as a witness without shrouding them in, in a sort of cloak of uh, victimhood. But that isn't what the state did. What mm -hmm. the, the prosecutors and the attorney general's office in Ontario did was turn her into a victim, or they tried to. She was the victim of, you know, wife battering. She was the victim of post-traumatic stress disorder. They had experts come in and testify. They were deferential to her in court. Mm -hmm. It was complete horse manure, frankly. Because she was as... She was a guilty, lip-licking participant in all of those sexual assaults, mm -hmm. if not in the actual murders, which weren't filmed, so we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but she was certainly not convicted of killing them. Then the state went with vigor that would have been more appropriately applied to the prosecution of Carla Homolka, they went after the peripheral players. They charged Bernardo's first lawyer, who was the guy who had held on to the videotapes because I believe he intended to use them in the cross-examination of Bernardo hmm. or Homolka. And his obligation, knowing their existence, was to turn them over, presumably. No, there, there, no? Is, there is now a rule which says, uh, the Law Society only recently passed a rule which says that if a lawyer comes into possession of that sort of material, they have to consult other lawyers, senior members of the bar, and hand it over. Mm. But there wasn't that law, that rule in place at the time. And there was some real debate about whether he ought to have handed, it, handed the tapes over or not. In any case, though, he's a peripheral player. He was only mm. Bernardo's lawyer for five minutes, really. He was charged not only with holding on to the tapes, which is fair enough, but he was charged with possession and distribution of child pornography. It was completely not an appropriate charge. Mm. No one ever suspected he was doing anything like that with those tapes. But the government, the state, charged him with those crimes to ruin him, to smear his name. Then they dropped the charges because, of course, the charges were baseless. Mm. They also went after a writer, Stephen Williams, who wrote two highly excellent books, but highly critical of the plea bargain, of the process, of the players. And they went after him, not only criminally, charging him with 
breaches of pub bans that in the scheme of things didn't matter because everyone else had, including you know the Canadian Encyclopedia, had broken the same bans. Mm -hmm. They also went after him civilly, which is where you are really bankrupted if you try and defend yourself in two ways and you don't get a civil lawyer to even speak to you for less than 50 grand. Hmm. So they went after Stephen Williams and ruined him. They bankrupted him. If he didn't have Eddie Greenspan, the late Eddie Greenspan, working for him for free on the criminal side, he probably would have ended up being even worse off than he is. But oh, it was, it was a, an outrage. Well, once the tapes were discovered, though, why did the plea bargain still go forward since they had such hard evidence? That's a good question. Never and, been a and satisfactory especially, answer. Well, especially mm. since the plea bargain was contingent on Homolka telling the truth. Mm. They had pretty good evidence before the trial of Bernardo even started that she hadn't told them the truth. She'd forgotten one of the many assaults and one of the many mm. victims and only remembered when she was presented with a snippet of videotape. So there was a police chief willing to lay charges and a prosecutor willing to prosecute, but the government didn't have the balls. Hmm. That, of course, was more than two decades ago. Let's do one more recent, Gomeshi, which everybody talked about for quite a long time. Your view on how the judge handled that case? I thought it was brilliant because I, I was living in fear that what he would do was go through you know, the pro forma lip service to the I believe Lucy crowd, the I believe the victims crowd, the, all the hashtag justice people, um, and say, you know, this doesn't mean I don't, you know, think, ah, you just can imagine what he might have said. And he said none of that. What he said was these women were incredible, and they certainly weren't. The hashtag that you just referred to, there's a couple actually, been raped, never reported, yep. or I believe women, yep. useful in the grand scheme of things? Well, I, Helpful sure. Helpful to the cause? I don't think there is a cause. I think the cause is getting a, a fair trial. And uh, I, it certainly wasn't helpful to him getting a fair trial. He got a fair trial be, because the, the complainants imploded because he had a good lawyer and he had a good judge. Uh, okay, except that he, well, how do we want to put this here? There are too many women in this province and country who feel that for far too many years the tendency has been to dismiss and or not believe their claims when they come forward saying they have been the victims of sexual assault, sexual right. violence, whatever. And, and this trial seems to have been wrapped up in all of that and the fact that he skated at the end of the day left a lot of, I, I think it's fair to say, left a lot of women wondering whether or not there is such a thing as justice in this country for people who've been the victim of these kinds of crimes. Sure, I understand. Alleged crimes, let's yeah, call them. Yeah, I, un I understand that. Is there that, something to that? Well, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't purport to tell people how to feel about things. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, those are legitimate responses and all of that. I just don't share them. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's far more important, especially now, because an allegation of sexual assault or sexual misconduct of any kind is instantly and probably irreversibly ruinous. So you better be sure that the person you're accusing actually gets a fair trial, if only in the criminal courts, because he ain't going to get one in the public eye and on social media. He's not. I mean, where's Gameshi ever going to work again? Walmart, he might get away with. Do you know what? I've heard that said about so many people, and this is a... Um... This tends to be a very forgiving culture that gives people second and third chances. Well, I think that's good. I think people should get second and third chances. I don't have an issue with that, believe me. I think it's good, but not with sexual crimes. You give me, give me one example. I mean, I can think of people in our business who have committed ethical breaches, who have, in some cases, the former Prime Minister, Brian Mulroney, taken three bags of cash after he left office. Uh, surely that's not what we want. All of those people can recover. You can recover, but you really struggle to recover your reputation if you've been charged with sexual misconduct, even if you've been a a acquitted. I was going to say, the, the, the president-elect of the United States hasn't been charged with anything, to the best of my knowledge, or maybe he has and it just hasn't happened yet. But there's been plenty of accusations of sexual assault there, and he seems to have <laughs> come through it quite tickety-boo. Well, I wouldn't, uh, I don't expect that that will last. I mean, if, if there are actual allegations against him, I, uh, criminal allegations, uh, or even just social media allegations. Well, there's an outstanding rape charge from California from many years ago that I'm not sure has been, anyway, you, you see what I'm saying here. Yeah, right? no, anyway. I know, I don't disagree with you, but mm. he's, you know, as in so many ways, Donald Trump is uh, an anomaly. He he, is. Uh, you know, most men don't recover. Mm -hmm.
Let's play, Sheldon, we've got this clip uh, lined up here. Uh, Dr. Lori Haskell, clinical psychologist, was on this program recently talking about the Gomeshi case. Let's play this clip and then we'll sure. come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. We saw from, you know, the Gomeshi case, there was a lot of focus on, you know, post-victim assault behavior. So I think, you know, you have people who've been confused, overwhelmed in the moment, right, because of the neurobiological uh, responses. But then there's a confusion, and my clients will say this, and most of my clients who were sexually assaulted contacted their offender afterwards. Because there's, did, re did this really happen? Did, maybe he'll make a repair. Maybe he didn't intend to do this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I really care about him still. That maybe I can overcome this. So there's this confusion of, is this, did this person really violate my body? Maybe they didn't intend to. So, and I think those, for later on, when someone's thinking, well, if this was an event that happened, you would have a really clear response about it. Mm -hmm. But it isn't, it's confusing. Does she have a point there? Yeah, she does. It is complicated. It is nuanced. Uh, I, I accept completely that some, because, you know, sexual relationships, even when they turn bad, mm -hmm. like her clients have, um, are complicated things. And I can see that women might contact somebody and say that. I always thought that the first complainant in the Gameshi case, um, Linda Redgrave, um, she contacted him afterwards and I think went out with him uh, after the first incident one more time. And I understood why she did that. But Lucy de Couture, uh, who, and the second complainant, whose name I think is still protected by a pub ban, um, they told the court and the police and everyone else, and on social media, Lucy de Couture told the world, after this choking and slapping incident happened, I never wanted to be seen with Gameshi except in a public place. I didn't feel safe, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Then we find out that not only did she want to see him once again, maybe to reassure herself, as Ms. Haskell, Dr. Haskell said, that you know uh, it had really happened, she contacted him dozens of times. She wrote him a love letter. Her first contemporaneous uh, utterance after the alleged assault was, was to... Uh, send him an email saying, I wish I'd, we'd spent the night together. Uh, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. this, I recognized echoes of my own behavior in love affairs in those notes. I know, I know what I was reading. I was reading a woman in pursuit and a woman who didn't give a rats about whether she was with him alone and in, or in public. She tried to be alone with him. Same with the second complainant. She said, oh, I was very scared. I didn't want to be seen. I didn't want to be alone with him. I would see him in public where it was safe. Then we find out she took him home one night hmm. and had a sexual encounter with him. Forgot to tell the police about that. Forgot to tell everybody. If you're good for, for victims of sexual assault, should not be afraid. It is complicated. It's nuanced. People will understand some of what looks now like odd behavior. What well, they won't understand are 5,000 Facebook messages between you and another complainant, and they won't understand love letters to the guy and saying that you wanted to screw his brains out all night. Come on. Or it, they might understand, but you got to tell us about it. Hmm. Let's finish up on this. Do you ever get bored in court? No. No. You never do, eh? No. I mean, I get impatient in court mm -hmm. where, you know, I'm yada yada when the lawyers are blowing smoke up one another's bums. I, I certainly do. And, you know, there are technical arguments that I don't enjoy listening to. But honestly, I don't get bored in court. The criminal courts are a fascinating place. As are you. <laughs> Thanks Thank so much for coming in tonight. Thank you very much. Christy Blatchford, life sentence. Hell of a read. And you know what? I, I, you, you had the filter on today. I was very impressed. <laughs> you know, you kind of, you, you, you for. I'm not sure what the past participle of forego is, but you forewent opportunities to, like you didn't say a rat's ass, you just said a rat's. Yes, well, I, I'm no. trying to be deferential to the media. Public television. Good yes. For you. Thanks, Christy. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.